Well, uh, oh yes, thank you, Joe. Forgot to hit the record button. I was just waiting for the announcements. That was I was just okay. Now the announcements are over. Welcome to Huddle, everybody. Let's get right into it. How do we get a new client in seven days? So before we start going down, I've got a bunch of bullet points here. I have to confess that in my rest while I was on the beach at Newport, uh, I'm I'm. <laughs> the revelations were just coming, all these ideas. And so I couldn't turn it off. And Tammy's like, who are you texting? And I'm like, I'm not texting. I'm making notes. Well, what are you, what are you making notes about? And I said, how to get a new client in seven days. So <laughs> can't turn it off. Uh, how about we all share our ideas? If you, it, it, look, it, let's say, you know, you need to get a client in seven days. Um, haven't you, you closed everything out? You're finding yourself with no one who's... Uh, Ready to go. You're not showing houses. No one's buyer brokered. And there's no listings. What would you do? What would you do if you needed to get a new client in a week? Sit floor and dial for dollars. All right. Sit floor. Awesome. We're all taking notes, right? So sit floor. Uh, what was the other one? Dial for dollars, Tyler? And what would you mean by dialing? Who who would you call? Past clients, SOI. Anybody who will listen. <laughs> what are you saying to past clients? Um, checking in, market update, high level. Um, are they here for the 4th of July? Um, what are their plans? Keep it casual. Nice. I love that. Perfect. That's great. That's a keeper. Uh, if you, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of you on the call have got hundred past clients. If, if you call them all checking in, you'll generate something out of that. So I love that. That's simple. That's easy to do. Let's say you don't have any past clients. So let's take that off the list. Who, who are you calling? Uh, Tyler said, what about your center of influence? So what are you going to say to your center of influence? Just family, friends, acquaintances, Who, when you're calling them, what, what are you saying? Can, can I participate, Will? Absolutely. Well, you know, some of the coaching we do for our, uh, our finance team is to make sure that we're checking back in on them, right? Their family, their friends, how's the summer going? Hey, how's little Jimmy? You know, how, how does T-ball finish up? You know, those are the types of things. We don't jump into business and say, hey, do you have a friend or referral? But we mm -hmm. absolutely do end with, hey, if, if you know of anybody that's interested uh, or in need of financing, hey, I, I hope you keep us in mind. Um, do you guys remember the, thank you, Travis. That's really good. Do you guys remember the Ford F-O-R? Yeah, Sharon's not her head. So what is the structure there? What When you're saying, hey, how are things? What... What's the F-O-R-D remind us of? Family, occupation, recreation, and um, uh, <laughs> forgot D. Sharon, help Travel. him out. Dancing. Dance, <laughs> dancing. <laughs> That's not dancing. Travel. <laughs> Let's travel, but like destination, isn't it? The, dreams is the, the dreams. Dreams. There you go. There you go. Th there you go. We got you. We got you. See how smart we are as one think tank? There you go. Yeah. So, yeah, how's the family? How's work? Uh, what's the summer look like? I mean, Tyler just naturally went to, hey, you sticking around for recreation. Well, that's really the the Ford uh, structure is what's going on for the summer plans. And that sounds interesting. And, well, that sounds fun, right? And then dreams are like, what? yeah, what are you hoping for? Uh, there, Scott got it too in the chat. So uh, that's a good reminder when you're just checking in. Uh, I love that. Um, okay, what else? What are other some other ideas, Rob? You got yeah. one? Yeah, I, what I would break things up in dealing with this is I, I, I typically thought of things in two ways, looking at immediate business or future business and trying to find the sources that fall into those categories. Uh, your your SOI can be both because you're you're checking in on your, your SOI regularly. Some may be ready to do business now, but a lot of that, routine checkup is so that in the future when they're ready to 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 move or 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 do something that you're the first thought that comes to mind but there are people that are we know that they that 
at they either want to sell today or that they did want to sell. For example, ones that come to mind, and we have fewer of these, but for sell by owners, expireds. Now, even though an expired, they at one point wanted to sell and something happened that I guess frustrated them enough or for whatever reason, they decided not to sell. But renters, they might be something that that if they were able to get into something today, whether or not they can qualify, that could be immediate business. So um, the, the then the other ones that were brought up, yeah, your SOI, your attorneys, accountants, business relationships that you're you're reaching out to is to establish for future business. So just breaking them up in those two kind of categories and working both areas. Nice. I love it. I love it. I want to, that's great. I hope everyone's taking good notes. Those are some great tips. Um, I want to jump back to the first thing that Tyler says, sit floor. Uh, so what, what if we're, uh, what's akin to sitting floor? What's, what's like that? Open houses. Yep. Yeah. Open houses. So, uh, yeah. And it's DJ who weighed in on that. We were just talking about this yesterday. DJ is a uh, true professional. You guys, he's been in the business for many years and understands how important it is to kind of get back to the things that are the fundamental practices of lead generation. It's hard to really think even today in 2024, that there's something more productive for generating new business than an open house. This is really, really good. It's still a, a, a fantastic way. And for any of you who are listening to this and you don't believe what I just said, I will tell you what one of my mentors told me. Your belief in it is not required. What is required of it is that you do it. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, uh, okay. <laughs> so holding an open house is very, very uh, productive way to generate a new client. Um so if you've gotten out of the habit of doing that, take a look at your week and trade your Saturday for a Thursday. Make Thursday your Saturday or Wednesday your Saturday or Friday your Saturday, whatever you want to do, but get back to holding an open house on Saturday. Uh, if you skip that one, it's really tough because uh, that, that's one of the best ways to generate a new client is to be on uh, where the traffic is. And some houses are really fantastic for this and others not. So uh, in, in other words, don't just jump to, you know, like the highest sales price. It has nothing to do with traffic. Go where the traffic is and, uh, and you'll meet people, right? Okay. Um, give me another idea before I get to my bullet point list. I will. Can you hear me? I sure can. Go ahead. Paige. Right. So, um, I did an open house last Saturday or two Saturdays ago that, um, you know, there was two groups that came through and, and I got an offer and I, I always think about open houses as just uh, odds. If you do it enough times, you're going to get, pick up clients, you're going to make sales. And so, you know, it's not my favorite thing, but I do them not every week, but pretty close. I think they're right. important. And that's generated business for you, right, Paige? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think what happens is we hold an open house and then, it, you know, there's not a lead generated from it. And so some, some of us get a bad idea about open houses. Um, uh, and that that's too bad because, uh, you know, one open house does not make enough of uh, momentum. Um, there's a uh, matter of fact, one of my points is, is remember prospecting and lead generation is numbers game. Uh, this is very much a contact sport and you've got to contact people. You've got to be in front of people. You, you know, like if I just said, this business is all about fill in the blank, what would you say? This business is all about what? Talking to people. Yeah. Talking to people. This business is all about, keep it going. Relationships. What else? Relationships. So people, relationships, this business is all about, what else did you say? The real estate business so, is all about blank. Helping people achieve their, their dreams. So it's, it's people, it's people, it's people. It's like, it's relationships. And so you can judge, a, a, look, a top agent of production wise is simply one who contacts more people, is in front of more people. And I, I think that's a lot of, like when, I, when I'm talking to agents who are struggling with production, 
you know what? Most of them are amazing professionals. That's not the problem. They know the reps, the forms, they know the processes. Anyone would be lucky to have them as their rep representative. That's not the problem. The, the problem is meeting people, contacting people. So our goals around this should be, should be we, we need to put numbers to this because, you know, it matters. So let's track it. Let's, let's get some discipline around it. And let's think about what we do every day and how we rate the success of a day should be tied to, the, to these numbers because they're critical in our, in our production, our survival in this business. So if we just said it's all about people, it's about, it was said different ways, but it's all about people. I have another comment, Will. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, this morning, a past client um, sent me a text with a picture of a, like a little drop bag that a realtor had dropped on their porch with um, talking about um, looking for a listing and had like some candy in it and just little things. She's telling me a thing saying, hey, you might need to up your game. And so instead of just texting her back, I called her and we talked for, I don't know, 10 minutes, had a great conversation, caught up with each other. She told me every time I, anybody talks about a realtor, I always refer you and tell them you got to call my realtor. So it's, you know, where if I would have just sent a text, that would have never happened. I think we got to actually be talking to people, not just texting back. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. Texting can, can be a problem um, in relationship building. There's a time for it. And I think all of us are just going to analyze each situation. What Paige is saying is that these drop bys and, and stopping by and being thoughtful uh, about people is, is really great. And uh, it, it shows that they, they matter and they, and they care to you or that you care. To, they matter to you. Right. And that you care about them. Um, there's a little warning about this. You got to be careful about something that our relationships with people is not just because they're a transaction to us, right? And yet in our in their lives, I want to be known as their realtor professional. You know, so um, I would just say be careful about being too salesy in the process. Uh, and yet one of my points is is that. Are we asking for the business? And yet the, the warning flag is don't ask every time. Like, like Tyler just said, you're reaching out to them and you're keeping it casual. In other words, you're not calling going, hey, are you, you know, ready to do a real estate transaction? At the same time, there are times when we're not asking. And, and I, I, so just a simple little script here. When the time is right, I would love to help you. You can expand that. You could, you could talk specifically about what might be in the way, but when the time is right, I would hope that you would know, you know, I'm looking at Sharon. Again. Sharon, I hope you know that I would love to be the one that would be able to help you. I'd love to be your agent when the time is right. But, you know, we're conceding that what's more important is when the time is right. That's the most important thing. But I'm also asking for the business. So are there times, just analyze yourself here. And this is only you, really can coach yourself here. I'm asking you, are there times when you're not asking for the business? And if there are, ask. And at the, on the flip side of that coin is, are you always asking for the business? That might be too much. Analyze that. Think about that. Okay. So only you can answer, but that, I hope you're writing that down. Well, an agent yes. in my business, Sally McCain, whenever yeah. she closes a transaction, she always makes it a joke. She always says, hey, I'm out of a job now. Do you know anybody who needs my services? I need, uh, you know, she's out of a job. Just close that transaction. So it's a very lighthearted way to ask for the referral. I, okay. I haven't heard that one. I'm writing that down. I'm out of a job. <laughs> Referrals. I love it. All right. Let's hang on to that one. That's a good one. If you've got a closing coming up, there's your line. I'm out of a job. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. I, I love that, Sharon. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else got an idea or should I hit the bullet points? There is someone that has their hand up. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, phone number. Who's 435-640? You can might, not, and ask, might have been a fat finger on the sign-in. 
Okay, got it. Okay. Um, I got tons of material here, guys. So maybe the best thing to do here is let me... Um, Uh, hey, Mike or Joe, could you share page 162 and 163 of the coaching manual? Yeah, give me a sec. Hey, while you're doing that, um, we already talked about number one is to analyze if you're asking enough or too much. That's number one. Number two is really your next client is likely from a pool of people you've already contacted and follow up is key. So now we're analyzing how good is your follow up? Are, are you reaching back and staying in touch? And then instantly, when I think of follow-up, we don't follow up just to say, hey, how are you? And I'm, you know, I'm just checking back in. We need to think about problem solving. The best follow-up is problem solving. And then sometimes, well, I don't know what the problem is. Then discover what's the problem. So if, if real estate transactions being considered, what are the things that might be in the way? How can I provide information, experience, right? Counsel on what those things are so that they either become more clear and we don't do a real estate transaction or they become more clear and we are going to do a real estate transaction. Hey, Will, give me those uh, page numbers again. 162 and 163. All and right. If you guys actually have your manual, you can add to it. I've added a bunch. If you, I mean, look, this is add my- Links in the chat. Yeah. These are my notes here, guys. So we're adding to what's already there. Um, so we got ask, follow up, and then the third one is value. And, and the best follow up is when I'm providing something of value. So I'm thinking about something that would help them. That's why I'm calling. That's why I'm following up. Number four is solving problems, which we just talked about. So what's in the way, identifying problems. If we're going to have a real estate transaction, if it's a yes, what, what does that look like? If it's a no, what does that look like? What's in the way? The next one is we've got to devote time to finding new business. This is a this is a problem for entrepreneurs and independent contractors because there's no one telling us when we do what we do and how we do it. Right? This, that's it. Like if we did, we'd be breaking tax law. Brokers don't do this. Only you can make your schedule. And, uh, you know, I've said a million times, uh, the independence of real estate will either be a noose on your neck or wings on your back. And it's up to you. So if you're not, if you're not being, you know, disciplined and breaking up your time, take a look at this and look at your day and start time blocking uh, for finding new business. And an open house, whether if no one comes through the open house, that three hours is time blocking for prospecting. I'm reaching out to people. I'm staying in touch with them. I'm returning emails, right? I'm doing that during the three hours of my open house. If no one came in, that three hours should be very productive. Um, number six on that list is the mindset. And uh, this mindset is critical because it's your attitude and how you uh, per portray <laughs> Rob. <laughs> you, do you want to share this story or do you want to just bypass it? Or what do you, what do you think? Uh, I'm happy to share it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh-oh, everyone pay attention. <laughs> All right. So you're going to tell when I was the married story or no? <laughs> sure. If you, if you want me to there, look to some, to some degree, I think we all have moments that are like this. Others, it might be a little more difficult for you. Sad to say that I think my relaxed state or facial impression basically just says get away from me kind of thought i have a scowl <laughs> i, I do not agree but <laughs> yeah case in point so this is 11 years ago i had just proposed to my wife and she said yes by the way so i had every reason to be excited and happy and we we were down in vegas when we did this and we were we were walking in front of the bellagio watching the the fountains 
having a great time. And about 15, 20 feet away from us, a total stranger yells, is, is trying to get my attention. He's, he's yelling, hey, hey, you, hey, you, pointing at me. And I'm like, what, me, me? And he's like, yes, you. And then he does this. He point, goes to himself like, smile, smile. So here I just got engaged and my wife said yes. And apparently I have a natural scowl on my face. So if that is your natural reaction and who you, who you tend to be, which apparently I am, you have to work at making sure that your face does not say F off. <laughs> so Joe, I don't have that luxury that you have. So I have to work at it. So there you have, there you have it. Rob, is that similar to the resting Rob face? Is that is that what you're deeming it? Uh, this is something my wife just has to deal with. She just like, you, you, we've all heard that. Hey, you know, if you're happy, you might want to let your face know that. <laughs> so anyway, so yes, I have to work at things like that. Oh my goodness. That's a great story. Uh, thank you for it, sharing. It's so true. When we're, when, when we talk about communication, oftentimes many of the things that, that we're on the phone, where that 7% of our communication are the words that we use. The other, what, uh, I think it's like 38% is our tonality and our, our, and then the other 55, the, the nonverbals are our enthusiasm energy. All of those factor in. And if we don't, if we don't, convey that very well. Some people, Angie, my heavens, so easy for you. You have just this natural invitation that you bring people to you. My, I have to make an effort at this. and But that is a form of communication. And when you're with your client, if you don't convey that, nobody wants to be around that type of a person. So for <laughs> those of you who do well, congratulations. <laughs> Uh, nice job, Rob. Appreciate that. We were just joking about that. Rob was down here in my office a minute ago, and and uh, I turned to him and I went, <laughs> and then I got this story. So uh, thanks for sharing. It's so true. But that's why number six is our mindset, and we stay positive, and uh, you know we find the good things. Uh, we're grateful uh, for people, and we just generally a good demeanor is very attractive. And people want to be around that. And, and I think that when you're smiling, it, it shows that you're relaxed about it. And real estate can be very, very complicated and can be naturally stressful. So if the leader of the transaction, you know, can, can be smiling and you're portraying confidence. And I think that's very important when you're building relationships with people. So remember that, that your smile is portraying confidence and uh, it's attractive. So we already did number seven, which is the numbers, but uh, you want to get a client in a week. Then, um, so one of my mentors told me that if I have a goal, he said, if you do the activities less than three times a week, then it's a zero. Okay, because there's not enough momentum. So minimum of three days a week or three hours each day is my interpretation of getting a client in seven days. If you didn't do, if you did two days, it's not enough. There's just not enough activity towards it. And it, it'd be kind of, it's, it's kind of like eating well, uh, you know, during a week. I, I, I mean, I could completely blow a diet in, in, uh, and not eat well. And it, prospecting has the same fundamental principles to it. When we're finding people, we need to devote the time to it. We need to be consistent enough with it. And this is all on us. The no one like our Mel Gibson, not Mel G Gibbons, the, the the gal, the blonde gal, the coach, the the five second rule. Uh, she she said like no one's coming to save you. I, I was like you know she's true. Like like I have to own this. I have to ask. Do I ask enough? Do I ask too much? Do I follow up? Do I not follow up enough? Am I creating value by solving problems when I do follow up? Do I devote enough time? Am I smiling? Am I happy? Do I do I work at prospecting three hours a day, at least three days a week? That is what I have to understand. Like, I have to ask me this, okay? And my answers will determine what I do. And what I do will determine my income. As simple as that.
you can you can just dive right into that and and you find it out. So you know sometimes when you like help on what's in the way of our calendars, and uh, um, it reminds me of cleaning. The first step in cleaning something is to get rid of what you don't want. And the first step in reorganizing our priorities of our week is to get rid of the things that are not the best. So remember, it's the bad, good, better, best analysis. So the best thing for my time at work is this. And if something that is good is occupying that space, I'm going to need to get rid of the good and put the best in its place. And only you can answer that. So sometimes we have to get rid of the good and replace it with the best. Hey, uh, yes, sir. I would also define, you're talking about activities. Yes. I would separate the activities in two, in two categories, active and passive. Yeah. So there's act, the active activities are things that we can control. So meaning if you jump on the phone, you're controlling that action. Versus you brought up sitting at an open house. Well, if I'm all I'm if I go to an open house and all I'm doing is waiting for people to come to me and I'm not doing anything, that's a passive activity. I'm I'm putting myself out there, but I'm I'm relying upon others to come to me versus while I'm at the app, the open house, as you mentioned, if nobody's there, great. Take an active approach and make phone calls while you're waiting for people to show up. So there's certain activities we can do. The, the active ones we have control over, the passive ones we typically don't. If I send out a mailer, I'm waiting for people to call me about potentially buying or selling real estate. But if I call them, I'm taking more of an act, active approach. Love it. And very true. Okay, let's go on to um, the next page. And I've got some things to add to this, but this is page 163. So page 163. So we already talked about how important it is to follow up with a lead. How many additional contacts to, to transition a lead to a client? Uh, there's been a lot of studies on this, but in the industry of real estate, it's seven. Seven forms of follow-up. Um, we already we did already hit on this. Uh, Tyler, right from the start, said contact. He said sit floor and contact SOI. They've always been the number one and number two ways to generate new business. They will, they still are today. So simply ask yourself how well you're doing that and uh, change it and you'll, you'll improve your results. So contacting our SOI, the overwhelming majority of business originates from people you already know. Uh, they want to refer you. Uh, the majority of people uh, really want to see business go your way. And uh, so we need to put ourselves in a position in which to do that. Uh, while you're at it, I made a note to work on getting your database uh, while you're doing prospecting. Think about your full data set of data inside your database. So make sure you have the email for personal. You also have uh, work emails and phone numbers so you can text and you have you know addresses of where you can mail things because there's different kinds of con uh, contacts we can make. And if we have a full data set in which we can use different tools um, to uh, to prospect. Uh, on my notes here, um, I'm going to sing some praises here of a special teammate. Uh, Rob and I were just talking about this. It occurred to me that if you are, if you're, look, if you've been at Brookshire for a while and you realize you're not utilizing tools that are in Brookshire, um, there, there's help. <laughs> there's help for you. There's a 1-800-HELP-ME-USE-TOOLS line. <laughs> it happens to be Jill Stringham's phone number and email address. Uh, but look, th this is Jill's job is to help you guys get the usage of the benefits that we have at Brookshire. If And she'll do a one-on-one, -on -one, she'll do a group, whatever you need. So if you're struggling with using some of these tools, remember Jill is your gal and she'll help you uh, she'll help you get the uh, the usage up on on these tools because a lot of them are built for prospecting and and finding new clients. Uh, Jill, did I miss anything there? Would you echo that? Uh, I didn't warn you that I'd be bragging about you today, but uh, um, I'd say ditto. you did a good job. <laughs> okay. Didn't didn't miss a thing. Okay, good, good, good. Well, contact Jill. She'll do a one-on-one -on -one coaching if you need it. 
There should be no reason for us not to be utilizing the tools that we have. Okay, I'm kind of moving down the list. We already did talk about the open house, but I, I you know, there's more you can do here. And uh, Rob, this might change open house from being passive, more passive to active. If I put signs out and I, uh, and I sit at the house, which I think a lot of us do, uh, which is fine, it's better than not, but what if I also contacted the surrounding 100 or 50 people in the neighborhood? What if I invited them? What if I knock on their door, introduce myself and say, by the way, uh, not sure if you're aware, but we are having an open house on the property around the corner, whatever that might be. You could talk about it. You know, you can say, by the way, it's a, it's a 4,200 square foot, five bed, three bath, three car garage, whatever that it is. I've noticed that that does get people's attention uh, when you're talking about the house you're holding open, even just briefly. And it's not a bad way. I know in 2024, are we knocking on doors? People are like, who's knocking on the door? There's a whole comedian who does a whole skit on this, <laughs> you know, like in the 80s, you, you know, oh, we've got company. And then today's like, the FBI is at my front door. <laughs> but it's still a really great way. Ask Peter Felis how he does with uh, with door knocking. And he, he does it religiously. Um, he's very disciplined about it. And he generates a lot of business in his uh, farm area from just meeting people at the door. And um, so, uh, of course, an attractive guy like Peter knocks on your door, you know, uh, you're gonna be like, okay, this guy is legit. There you go, Peter. I, I just called you an attractive man. We're the same age, by the way, Peter and I were on the same football team in Little League at Brighton. And we went to dances together and uh, we were friends back in high school. So fellow Bengal. Um, so the networking is number four. This is uh, this is kind of married around. Um, I want you to think about this. Um, what are your social activities that? Um, matter of fact, I see Barb Larson on uh, my screen, and I, you know, on Facebook, I see uh, the boat out on the lake, and I think to myself, the boat is a great place to do business. Really? How could the boat be a great place to do business? Well, it's simple. You just invite people to go boating with you. <laughs> and next thing you know, you've got a great way to prospect and you can write the boat off. <laughs> Barb, am I right? <laughs> right? This is how we justify buying new boats, by the way, just so you know. I'm just like, I want to be clear. It's all about the business. I mean, I'm, I'm a dedicated business person. You know, I've got goals and I need a boat in order to reach those goals. Okay. Um, I did have someone ask me, well, you write your boat off. Said, oh yeah, I write my, my, my boat off and I take pictures of everyone who's been a client who's been buying my boat. <laughs> you know, here's a builder <laughs> who's surfing, you know? Um, yeah. So, but anyway, on a more, maybe more serious, but uh Think about your social connections and how you can have fun meeting new people, expanding your center of influence. They get to know you. You introduce yourself. This is a great way to expand our center of influence and have fun at doing it. Uh, this, you know, I mean, years ago, I'm talking to Nancy Ernie. It's and she's like, "Will I got to go?" And I'm like, "Well, you called me, you know." And she's like, "I've got to, I've, I've got to go. I'm, I'm going skiing. I'm walking out the door right now." And I'm thinking, we just got talking about you know, time management and the importance of discipline and how you find new people and you're going skiing. Most of her clients are found on the ski slope. That's how she finds her clients. And she wants, she doesn't want to ride up the ski lift with someone she knows. She wants to ride up the ski lift with someone she doesn't know so she can get to know them. So what are your what are your uh, social hobbies that are fun in which you get to know people? And take a little inventory of that. And how can that be a great way for you to um, potentially find a new client? Um, people will ask us, how's the market? So I wanted to just make sure I, I quoted Steve while Steve was in the sales meeting on uh, uh, Tuesday that we want to give you uh, an information advantage. And I thought that was a great way to simply say what 
way, when we look at data and statistics and when Travis weighs in and his team on what's going on econ with the economy and, and, and mortgage rates and, the, and all that, that we're trying to give you an information advantage. So you have the information. It, it's the way that you present that that I think there's a skill set there. Re remember, we're going to talk about the impact of the data. Like, what does it mean? Okay, so when we say rates are likely to be, I'm just using rates, then I want the effect of what that means, not just what the data point is. You're being paid, your value is in your wisdom and interpretation of data, not the delivery of the data. That's really important to understand. And this connects with prospecting because as you meet people and they, they're going to ask you, oh, it's nice to meet you, Barb. How, how's the market? You know, like, how's the title business? How's the mortgage business? What's going on in commercial? Do you guys know at Brookshire? Do you guys build a lot of new homes? What's going on in new construction? So you're going to get questions. What's important when you give data is to interpret what it means to them. What does it mean to a buyer and what does it mean to a seller? That's important for us. Because now you're counseling and that's where your value is. Uh, just a note to myself here, just when you're just thinking about when I'm talking about data, we've got big picture stuff and we've got very hyper local information. And I think it's important when we're talking about big picture data to say that that's what it is. Because every every market is so different and you've got to warn them of that. Uh, remember, we've been our own worst enemy over the last decades of oversimplifying what real estate agents do. Don't make the mistake of doing that. It's okay to be complicated because it is complicated. The truth is it's complicated. So if you're going to lean on big data, like let's say, well, the Salt Lake Board of Realtors is up 7% in its listing uh, inventory right now over last year, bringing our total to just under 10,000 units, about 9,800. Well, that's Salt Lake County. That doesn't say anything about, say, East Bench, West Side, South, new construction, the over million market, the condo, the townhome market. New construction it doesn't say anything about that. That's too big. So, so we make sure that when you're, if you're going to lean on big data, just disclose that that's exactly what it is. Okay. Um. All right. Uh, I'm going through my bullet point list again. How to get a client in seven days? If you got center of influence, you got past clients. All of us have center of influence. Many of you have lots of past clients and a big center of influence. I love the drop by. Mike, what do you what what do you think about like if I'm going to call or text or drop by, which one would be more effective in building my relationship? Uh, I'm dropping by every time. <laughs> <laughs> you'll pick you'll pick uh, drop by uh, Will for one thousand. Yeah, I think um, of all the things I've heard that agents uh, have a lot of success with and actually generate a lot of leads, it is a drop by pop by slash pop by um, because they're they're talking one on one They're you know, it may be a holiday or something. They can have a much easier conversation that way. Um, so, you know, I, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but showing up uninvited uh, produces pretty good results. IMO. Yeah, I was in the neighborhood, you know, I uh, out doing real estate today, thought about you guys, I'd pop by and drop by and see how you're doing. You know, and maybe this is one of those times where you're not asking for business. Maybe this is one you're asking for business. Uh, I'll just add to that, that the thing that to me that makes it great is I don't even know that you should be asking for business because if they're happy to see you and they have those ideas, they're probably going to offer them up anyway. Right. Um, you know. Right. Worst case scenario, you, you leave and say, by the way, you know anybody who wants to buy or sell real estate? You know, that's the worst case scenario that you have to say something, but most people will offer it. Unless you can't pick up on social Can I add something, your guts. Will? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great, Mike. Yeah, Barb, please weigh in. Yeah, so one of the, the sayings is you don't ask them to marry them on the first date. <laughs> um, and cold calling, I mean, cold calling has its place, but also warm calling. 
you know, if they never hear from you only until you're asking business, that doesn't look good. So having like some sort of drip campaign, and then it's a little easier to have that conversation that's more casual um, and to kind of build it from there and being able to slip in the business aspect of it as well. And they may even start talking to you about it. Yeah, I agree with, all, I 100% agree. Um, you know, generally speaking, the culture at Berkshire is to master sales processes, but not be salesy. And what you just heard from Barb and Mike and this whole idea of, un, you know, you drop by, but you don't always have to ask for business. I, I think there's times where it's just really not appropriate. Um, and and it, it could actually be a huge turnoff. So I got, you got to watch that. I, because it's the number one thing, are you asking enough when it is appropriate? Are you asking too much? Only you can answer that, right? Every situation is just so different. And to Barb's point, you're warming up the relationship over time. And uh, they've got to get time to get to know, you know, just or rekindle these relationships. Re remember, when you were in, if this is a past client, you built a friendship. How, how many months has it been? How many years has it been since you've seen these past clients? Like, how's the kids? You know, how's life? You guys still loving the house? You know, did you ever remodel that basement? What did you do with that bathroom? Right? I, I was just thinking about the time we first saw the backyard and what have you done? Did you actually put the hot tub in? I, I mean, there's so many ways this could go. You know, this business is all about people and relationships and good relationships. Relationships that are built on trust, right? So you're building, that's the objective is to make sure that you're advancing and building the relationship. And uh, there, there's a lot of, what builds your relationships? the ones you care about. It's people that you know you can trust because they care about you more in, in a business relationship. They care about more about you than they do the money. And, and that is what endures people. That's why they say to our agents all the time, I trust you, I'll just sign this. And our agents are going, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> this is a contract. I should probably explain it to you. And they go, no, I trust you. This happens all the time because they do trust you, right? And that's a good that's a good uh, uh, indicator of, of the relationship. Not what we should do, though. <laughs> I want to be clear. <laughs> we don't just go, okay, let's <laughs> just sign here. <laughs> We're still going to have them uh, go through that. I got a couple more points here. Um, when we're, I, you're a real estate professional. You should be talking a lot about the market and the real estate industry and and properties and things like that. Like you have a listing, boy, you're talking about that listing and what's great about it. Um, I don't think that you can go too far with that. I, I think you need to be own the space. You, you know, this would be like if I had a dentist who never wanted to talk about dentistry, I, that'd be weird. Um, and there's a lot of fun things about real estate. There's a lot of people love real estate. Um, Tam Tammy just took her friend down. They came all the way from Arizona to go do the parade of homes in Utah County. Uh, six ladies, not one of them intended to buy anything in Utah. And, but they had a ball looking at all these houses. Now, maybe later on, uh, that turns into a transaction or two here and there. Uh, but they had a ball looking at houses. Uh, by the way, I think the Utah County, does anyone know Utah County parade of homes is it over now? I want to look it up. Someone, I see Joe instantly Googling. <laughs> Utah Parade of Homes, dates are, but there were some fantastic homes down there. Uh, and I'm a huge fan of the Washington County Parade of Homes. It happens in February. Yep, there's Sandy's thumb up. Uh, it's it's incredible. Uh, some of the most beautiful homes I've ever seen. And and that's fun, right? I mean, it's uh, it's a great way to talk about real estate and the homes that we see, the decors that we see, the architecture, the changes, the trends. Uh, this is fun. You know, you can get a lot of that stuff, say, from Pinterest. I saw someone the other day, like, I'm just looking at Pinterest. Why are you at Pinterest? I, I want to talk about a couple of design things I saw in a house, but I don't want to take a picture of the house itself that was on the MLS. Yeah, let's not do that. But if you want to copy a post that had something, say, hey, I saw a couple of homes like this. This is an interesting trend. What do you guys think? Right? Designer trends. Kind of fun. All right. 
Okay, um, let's go to 164. So um, this is gonna, look, we had a interesting interview yesterday. I don't say too much that's confidential, but we interviewed a gal who has a Harvard degree. Um, I'm gonna say that again. We interviewed someone who's considering real estate who has a Harvard degree. I've never in my career interviewed someone who has a Harvard degree thinking about real estate ever in 34 years. It was a very interesting conversation. They happen to know one of my lifelong mentors from a distance. This is just someone I started to follow. His name is Clayton Christensen. He's the Dean of Harvard Business. I've quoted him a few times in Huddle and Coaching through the years. I uh, consider he was considered to be a, the best worldwide business consultant that you could possibly get. Of course, I mean he's the dean of Harvard Business. Like, who would you want to hire? The professor at Harvard, right? So uh, you could, look. You want to go on Amazon? There's a bunch of books that he has written or co-authored. It's Clayton M. Christensen. He has since passed away of a stroke about two or three years ago, unfortunately. But he conducted a seminar and it, it's, I'm trying to put this out in this bullet point number two, real estate is a contact sport. So I'm, I'm referring to him as a very smart person, but I'm telling you who the smart person was. It, it was Clayton Christensen. And it, it, this is a real estate seminar that was put on for broker owners. Uh, I was probably 15 years ago. And this guy comes out and instantly you knew that you had a very high intellect uh, per speaker. And he asked us this question, what is the first step in generating new business for you? He asked all of us that. You should have seen the look of confusion on everyone's faces. And that is a problem, isn't it? What if we asked our entire team, like Travis, I'm looking at you right now because I know what kind of thinker you are. What if we sat down with every loan officer and said, can you tell me something? What is the first step in generating new business for you? What if I, and I'm asking us as agents, I'm asking us as brokers, what is the very first step? Could you please tell me what that is? And he goes, again, he says, what's the step one? What has to happen first? He kept saying this. And we were all sitting there going, I'm not exactly sure what the first step is. Do you see why that's a problem? Because there's an, in, there's an income chain to real estate. And it begins with the first step. And then over time, it generates a closing. So how about this? He rephrased the question. Clear your mind for a minute. I want you to think about a transaction that just happened. Could you go back to the beginning and tell me where it started? What was the very first thing that happened? And all of a sudden, we started to get some clarity. Some people, but they were all different answers. But it's all forms of prospecting, like sales contacting, whatever you want to call it. By the way, Clayton Chris has nothing really to do as, as a specialist with inside of real estate. He, he's a business consultant and a master at it. Uh, probably one of the best minds ever. The reason I brought up the recruit yesterday is because <laughs> her dad is filling in for her for Clayton Christensen at the the business college of Harvard. I was like, are you kidding me? Your father is a professor at Harvard. Anyway, what an amazing lady. And what an, um, just thinking about how we think about business and being more effective at, you know, it, but also looking at it from intellectually. So what Clayton was trying to pull out of all of us, and I'm asking you, what is the very first step to your business? Now you need to start tracking that and you start counting it. And if you could put some mechanisms of measurement around your first steps, then you'll find your second and third and consequential steps after that. And you can start putting measurements and, and, and um, ways to track progress. Then you can start to predict outcomes. Most of the real estate individuals that I talk to are people, people, right? So how many of you would consider yourself to be an intellectual analytic? Anyone? Joe, okay. 
Travis, that makes sense. There's not going to be a lot of them, lot of them or us. There's just not. And frankly, that was what's kind of interesting about this is that real estate people, successful people are really good with people. And, and that's why we struggle with some of the intellectual analytics of the business. But trust me, guys, if you'll think about that and coach yourself on what those questions are and answers, then you're going to get some insight on what to do. Will, can I pop one thought in here? Please. please. So a lot of people, left brain, right brain. I'm a people person. I'm not a people person. Yeah. We live in a world where everything we do is interaction with people, right? And what typically happens is when you're someone that values more interactions with human beings, and they call us people people, right? I'm a people person. We have a higher fear of rejection because our desire is always to have a positive interaction with another person. If we are not offering something of value or if we are feeling like we are going to interrupt their day or I'm bothering them, it's because we value those things so much. So a question, and this is back to you know three decades ago when I started in sales training and things like that, one of the key elements is what is your core fear of rejection? What is it? Is it that you are going to invite somebody to participate in something magical and marvelous like you've mentioned before with the Ford acronym? Or, or is there some fear you have that you're just going to bother somebody? And if you can go inside yourself and figure out what that core fear is, it is because you value people. If you don't value people, you don't have a fear of rejection because the person rejecting you is a number or just a transaction or something. So the fear or that what if I don't, what if they don't want to hear from me? What if they don't want the drop by? If that's where you're stuck, it's because you care about people. So go inside and figure out what is it that you're really worried about? And I would propose it's probably because you're not sure that you're adding any value. And when you attend these trainings and when you go through all these things, I can tell you, you have value. You, you have the information, you have something that they want to hear. So ask yourself, what is it I'm actually afraid of? Because the hardest phone call is always the first one. The hardest drop by is always the first one, right? And that is because you care about other people. If you don't have that, I don't care what they say. I don't care about rejection. Odds are pretty good you do, but just be honest with yourself. And when you find that for yourself, you'll find that reaching out and making those phone calls and doing those drop bys and wanting to see people in person becomes a lot easier because you realize you value people. Very well said, Joe. Love that guy. Um, we are so lucky to have the team we have. Um, I can't think of a someone who knows technology who's like Joe Lowry. Joe is a one of a kind. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Thank goodness. Can you imagine two of me in this world? No, it's not good. It would be awesome if there were a ton of Joes. But uh, anyway, thank you for that insight. Look, guys, we're out of time. Uh, thank you for joining us on Huddle today. Um, you know, th this uh, the purpose of all of this is say there's answers to my questions. There's a path and there's a plan. And I can, you know, control what I can control. And I can dictate my outcomes, you know, daily, weekly, monthly basis. I can do that if I can stay consistent. And I'm just telling that you can. You just got to get started at it. You know, and th this fear thing, it's it's going to be okay. Everything is going to work out. You know, it, it, if you if you become a little too aggressive, apologize for it. Just tell them that you care so much. It's oh, it's going to be all right. Let's get out there and meet people. I've been I've been signing off with something I'm really committed to doing more of. But I want to remind you guys that you're amazing, and people would be absolutely over the top lucky to have you as their agent. So let's go find those to help because they're out there and they need a Brookshire Hathaway professional. They need you, right? They need you in this complex environment right now. Anyway, on behalf of Rob and Mike and Joe and Sharon and Sandy and Jill and all the leadership team, we love you guys. Reach out independently if you need more help.